so I'm just also going to lay out some quick thoughts uh, that, that maybe will help stimulate the conversation a little, a little later. I want to say four things. Uh, the first is about integrated response. There's been some discussion about this already. I think we're all, we're all in agreement, or we ought to all be in agreement. If you're not, you can leave. Um, <laughs> that this is California water is not just about water. It's about energy. It's about ecosystems. It's about economics. It's about technology. It's about it's about institutions. Part of the reason we haven't solved our water problems is because we've not addressed them in an integrated fashion. And it's more than integrated water management in the sense of uh, watershed management, which is an important piece of that. But until we do better at that, um, I don't think we're going to make much progress. So that's the first comment. Uh, the second comment is uh, sort of uh, related to the longage comment that Bob just made. This isn't a problem of supply. Uh, supply is the way we thought about water in the 20th century. And we built a massive infrastructure in California that's brought us enormous benefits. We store water a tremendous amount, we move water to tremendous distances. Uh, that infrastructure's brought us great benefits. It came with costs we didn't fully appreciate, but the supply side was only part of the issue. The other side of the issue was demand. And if we don't get more serious about really thinking about how to satisfy the things we want with less water, which is the way we at the Pacific Institute try to describe this issue of conservation and efficiency, then we're not going to solve the problem. And it gets back to this integrated issue. Um, it's a demand problem. Uh, and increasingly, the solutions are demand oriented because the traditional supply options aren't available to us uh, or are only slightly available to us. Having said that, there are some new things to do on the supply side as well, but they're different than we did in the 20th century. It's the, it's the stormwater capture, it's the treated wastewater reuse, some of which we heard about this morning. Uh, potentially some forms of desalination, whether it's seawater desalination or perhaps more appropriately, uh, brackish water desalination. So it's better thinking about supply and demand. That's the second point. The third point is, is this an opportunity, is the drought an opportunity? Uh, too good to waste? Uh, the answer is yes. Whether, whether we're wasted or not remains to be seen. Um, I guess it was uh, Kamiar this, this morning mentioned, look, we're in the third year of a drought. But in fact, we, maybe it could be considered an eight-year drought and we had a wet year in between. We could be in a long-term different hydrologic situation. But even if we aren't, I would note, even if in, even in an average year or a wet year, we're not managing our water resources properly. Even in a wet year, we're overdrafting groundwater. And if we're going to manage groundwater sustainably, that can't continue. So it's an opportunity. Is it too good to waste? We'll see. One of the things I learned um, just in the last few months about water in California is that we have the most variable rainfall in the country from a year-to-year -year basis. And so when you want to describe the severity of this, um, it, it, we certainly have less rainfall than last year. We have less rainfall than the wettest year ever. We have, we're seeing less rainfall than average. Frankly, for a while we were tracking for this to be the driest rain year ever. Um, there are researchers on campus who are saying that this might be the worst drought that we've had in 500 years. And so that's why um, everyone is seeing such a response to this on the behalf of the water suppliers who are asking us to cut back and on behalf of the state and even the federal government in terms of um, providing resources and aid to the state. This current drought is relatively severe and it's causing a lot of people to ask questions about what our water supply is going to look like in the future. And so when a drought happens, there's relatively little you can do. You're kind of locked into the system you have. But if we expect more droughts in the future and droughts of more extreme severity, we're going to have to rethink the way we deliver water to our cities. In the Bay Area, we do have three or four, well, at least four different water delivery agencies so our water comes from a variety of places and it depends and if you live in Berkeley or San Francisco or San Jose or Concord um, they all get water from different places actually so there, there are differences in how the droughts impacting it in different parts of the Bay Area. 
Well, the university uses some East Bay mud water, but they also have their own wells, uh, which they have turned to in previous droughts. And I don't know if they're using those on a regular basis or they only use that as a reserve. I think it's mostly a reserve. Otherwise, they're on the East Bay mud system like the rest of us. Now, the university in the last couple of big droughts in the 70s and 80s, um, they did a lot of adaptation, a lot of changing of plumbing fixtures uh, to get rid of some of the worst kinds of water, excessive water use, like permanently flushing toilets at, the, at Edwards Field. I remember that one they finally got rid of. So, I think the university's been fairly conscious and um, that our water use is not too extreme. In fact, that's generally true around the East Bay because of the, the drought of the 70s, which had a huge impact on, on uh, East Bay mud policy and general on the sort of culture of water use around here. And then that was reaffirmed in the mid-80s uh, when we had low water use. So overall, water use in the inner East Bay in particular is, is quite good. It's probably the best in California. And it's, uh, it's a bit worse out on the other side of the hills because you have a lot more heat in the summer and cold in the winter, and so you get a lot more water use for that. Well, Southern California has made a lot of progress thinking about their imported water supply because they've always been under a certain amount of stress and they compete for that water supply with other states. Here in the Bay Area, we're very fortunate that a lot of our water comes directly to us from the Sierra Nevada mountains. So we have the Hetch Hetchy system for San Francisco, and we have the Party Dam and McCollumney Aqueduct, which brings water to the East Bay. And those systems have been very reliable, but we think that in the future, they may not be as reliable as they've been in the past. And that's making people start to think about new approaches to bring water in and breaking our reliance on imported water. So there are a number of projects that are getting started slowly in the San Francisco Bay Area. For example, our local water utility, East Bay Mud, has some water recycling programs. And you can see the fields down by Highway 80 are watered with recycled water. And some of the recycled water is sent to Richmond, where it's used in the Chevron oil refinery. Um, there also have been some efforts to start thinking about bigger kinds of water recycling projects. So in the Livermore Valley, for example, the local water utility there has put a lot of effort into building a water recycling facility. And there have been discussions in Contra Costa County about building a seawater desalination plant to produce water from the brackish part of the San Francisco Bay. So the current drought is a bit of a wake-up call. These projects will bump along and people will experiment with them, but they won't get serious until they think the water supply is under threat. And so the current drought is really making people think again about these alternatives to report imported water. There's a lot of research going on on the different UC campuses uh, by faculty and graduate students and undergraduate students as well on how we can better utilize our water. So we've got research on everything from from uh, how to recycle urban water, so taking uh, wastewater and re being able to reuse it, how to capture storm water, okay, so stuff that's running down the street, not just let that wash out to sea. Um, we've also got research on the state's whole water system, so there's research going on at Berkeley and, and Davis and several other campuses on how do we deal with the California Delta and the water supply system, um, the way we move water between different places in California. Uh, there's also, even at Berkeley, there's quite a bit of research going on on agricultural water conservation. So agriculture is using 20, I mean 80 percent of the water, but they're also much more efficient with the water. And through 30, 40 years of research at the University of California, we've really increased that efficiency of agricultural water use. It still uses more water, but what we're actually doing is growing more food with that water. Well, the, the drought will be hard on California agribusiness. There's no question about that. This is really a severe drought this year. It's one of the worst years uh, in, on record. So, uh, and it's hitting, it's, it's hitting the central coast very hard, which is a major agricultural area, the San Joaquin Valley, uh, so, uh, which relies on a lot of water deliveries from the Delta. So these areas are gonna be impacted. There'll be a lot of land 
taken out of production this year uh, and some severe changes in crop planting and crop planting. There's a lot of other crops we grow in Northern California, from almonds to uh, pistachios to processing tomatoes, and different ones of those will be differently impacted. Most of the water will be saved to be used on tree crops, of course, keeping them going and keeping them alive for future years, and then the places where we grow an annual crop like processing tomatoes or lettuce or broccoli or something like that, that's where we'll see more of the fields fallowed and less, and, and the farming sort of stop on those lands. I'm not sure how much almond yields will be impacted. Most of the almond growers are going to be switching to groundwater sources. So in the short run, they shouldn't be too am impacted by yield. There's also something they can do that, we, that we've been researching at the University of California called deficit irrigation. And what it means is that during certain times of the year, you can actually give the, the tree less water than you would normally, than it needs. And it stresses the tree, but if you do it at the right time of the year, you still get the same crop. Now, because it stresses the tree, it's not something you can do year after year because eventually you'll overstress the tree and lose the tree or lose the crop. But for one year, we're actually fairly well off in terms of being able to adapt to that. So California's almond industry is about 80%, I think, of the world supply, which is humongous. Um, we may see some slowing of the growth of the industry because of the drought, because almonds have been just planted and planted and growing really fast. I'm a little reluctant to raise this, but I'm going to just to be provocative. <laughs> it's the issue of taboos. There are things we do not discuss, we huh. will not discuss, in California water. And uh, huh. it's time, it's time to discuss something. <laughs> For example, and I'm not expressing an opinion about any of these, <laughs> although I may have some. Um, what are, we, what are we choosing to grow? What kind of crops are we really going to grow? Thank you. That's just one. How much land ought to be in production? Uh, California is a great place to grow food. I think we, we ought to do everything we can to make sure our agricultural economy is great. It's great soils, great climate, lots of water, even in a drought year in many ways. But can we have a discussion about how much land is should be in production where? Uh, should we have a conversation about getting rid of phrases like toilet to tap and reuse of water in our urban centers? Should we have a conversation about whether or not lawns should exist in California? Anyway, there are lots of things that we don't really discuss, um, that we dance around the edges of that maybe ought to be on the table. Potable water, it's a, it, it does sound like a made up word almost. Um, the issue is potable um, is the technical fancy schmancy term for drinking water. Uh, it means that water has been, is at drinking water standards, it's been tested to be at drinking water standards. Um, Non-potable water is, you know, if you're hiking up in the woods and you come to a creek, you can consider that non-potable. You probably don't want to drink it. What most most of the non-potable water that, that, that is referred to again when the, in these kinds of conversations is reclaimed or reused water. So again, um, when we are washing dishes or taking a shower, water goes down the sewage drain and goes to the sewage treatment plant. Um, it gets cleaned up to reclaimed water standards, but not back up to drinking water or potable water standards. And so there are uses then for that reclaimed water. There are places where you can use that for irrigation. You can use that for flushing toilets. Um, it starts becoming um, logistically difficult because you need to have separate pipes because you don't want to risk mixing that drinking potable water with the non-potable water, and you need to have a source of it. So on campus, we don't really have a source of non-potable water. So almost all of our water at this point is potable water. What's interesting, one of the things that's being looked at at some communities, I know Tucson and Arizona has, I know some of the cities in California are looking, is taking that reclaimed water and treating it back up to drinking water or potable water standards. And some people, um, it, it can be expensive, but there's also kind of a public ick factor to it um, that may be something that's on the table as the state and, and at the federal level as we talk about how to respond to this drought and future droughts. I think we have to start seeing recycled water as a choice. Do we leave that water in the environment where it can support fish and aquatic ecosystems and farmers, or do we 
take it and use it in our homes and put it into the ocean after we're done with it. And when we think about whether that's something we want to do, we have to ask the question, is the recycled water safe? And so given what we know about the chemistry and biology of the recycled water, it seems safe. And it's safe compared to other sources of water that people routinely consume. And so the question is getting over our psychological feelings about the history of those water molecules. And that is something that as educated people who've learned about science and technology, we should be able to separate the cultural baggage that comes with water recycling from the actual science. So if you were an astronaut on the space station, you would drink that recycled water. We're all astronauts of sorts using water and reusing water here in California. The campus has an amazing number of student environmental groups. Um, I think the most recent count I've heard might be something close to 100. So I may not know at this point what everyone is doing, but I do know that the student sustainability team has worked, um, is working on an outreach campaign to campus where part of what they're looking at is the water footprint for, um, in part perhaps for some of the food that we eat, how much water it takes to grow those things. There's also a really interesting new group called the Water, excuse me, the Berkeley Water Group, um, which is a, um, a, a range of disciplines, students that are meeting together, I think even on a weekly basis, um, educating themselves about water supply and conservation related issues and who are um, stepping up and participating as well in, in some of the conversations the campus is having about water conservation. We've been working for several years to try to reduce how much water we're using on campus. We set a goal in 2011 to reduce use by 10% by 2020, sort of relative to 2008. We're over halfway there, but we still have quite a ways to go. Um, and, and how are we doing that? Well, part of it is through things like fixing leaks that, that, are, that, that can happen on a, both a small scale and a large scale, and it is part of um, just even how we maintain buildings. And so since 1990, the campus has reduced water use by 17% in total, even given growth in population and campus buildings. But as I said, this is, this is a drought that we haven't seen in a while, and so we know we need to do more. It does feel sort of, what, what good am I gonna do as an urban person if agriculture is using 80% of the water and urban is using 20% of the water? Um, something like that, you know, what good is it to save a gallon here and there? But you also have to realize that there are you know, what, 38 million people or something in California. So everybody doing a little bit makes a big difference for that. And the other thing to kind of remember is that, that water systems are local systems. So we do have a statewide drought going on, but it's impacting different communities differently. Um, so it's really, how do, how do you relate to your community? And do you feel like that community, you know, should save water? If you save water in your community, that's water for your community that, that helps stretch your supplies. So it's important to keep that sort of local perspective when we're thinking of it as well. Look, I, I have mixed feelings about this uh, very American idea of individual responsibility. Um, and on the one hand, uh, I do think people have to be aware of the environment and aware of what's going on. Uh, aware of uh, just, you know, dry years and wet years, climatic variability, and the fact that we can't just live our lives uh, always just turning on the tap and it's always there. As if nature and uh, natural variability didn't matter. So I do think in that sense, being conscious of your environment is a very important thing. Being willing to then take personal measures to respond to problems is very important too. But I think all of us have to feel that we're doing something in concert with other people and that we're not just flailing in the dark or just batting our head against a wall that nobody else cares about. So it's very important to have social institutions like water agencies, like uh, the, po the political institutions of the state the power of the state to say, yeah, we're all in this together. We all need to respond. Here's ideas about what to do. Uh, here are requirements, you know. Uh, here's ratio, we're gonna cut back by 10, 20, 30%, and we expect people to do that.
So there's a role for university researchers to play in helping to reinvent urban water systems. And I think that role that we play is thinking about what water systems are going to look like 10 or 20 years from now. In other words, the engineers who maintain our water systems are worried about the next six months or the next two years, and they don't have the time and effort, and often they don't have the expertise to think about what our water system should look like 20 years from now. And so that's where university researchers really can play a role in thinking about the new kinds of technologies and the new kinds of research that's needed to support those technologies. So the University of California is part of the National Land Grant University System and within that system in California what we have is we have researchers on campus and we have what are called cooperative extension specialists on campus and then we have um, cooperative extension advisors in every county of the state. And those three work together in a network, the researchers, the specialists, and the advisors, to take research and move it down into the field and to take problems from the field and bring it back to campus to look for solutions. So in those counties, we actually do have advisors who are working with farmers every day. They're working with water districts. They're working with uh, fishery agencies as well. So we do natural resources and environmental work as well. So it's an entire system and network that involves the whole university all the way down from the local level all the way up into the campus labs. And that's a really great system that we have that allows us to bring innovation from our laboratories and get them on the farm and find out what does and what doesn't work. So for instance, sometimes we'll take a new technology and we'll, we'll try it on a farm and we'll say it's not working right. And it's not working right because we're trying to manage it with our old management ideas with the new technology. So then we have to do a whole bunch of research on, well, what's the best way to manage this new technology in order to take advantage of it? So it's not just plop down a sprinkler system, it's figure out how to use that system with the crops you're growing, with the soils, with everything you have. And so we have that whole network that does all of that together to increase water use efficiency. I've been pleasantly surprised over my life going back to sort of the first responses, big energy conservation and water conservation moves that we had in California in the 70s. How readily people respond to that. Um, so Americans, we always talk about the individual, but in many ways we're a very collective and group-oriented people, and we actually want to have a sense of social responsibility and a sense of leadership and a sense that we're part of something bigger. When change comes to things like water systems or any large-scale effort that society uh, invests in, it usually doesn't come gradually, it usually comes all at once. And that change normally follows windows of opportunity. These windows of opportunity are the moments when the public and the politicians and the decision makers are paying attention to a problem. So we normally ignore our water systems and that's the way we like it because we have a lot of things going on in our lives. And so during this moment of drought when we're paying attention to the water system, it's time to start that discussion about what kind of water system we want for the next hundred years.